We might do some of this embedded put on paper. Otherwise, if you hear me sing the words out, then you know what? I've gone off. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Use it for now. Shabbat Shalom. 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 So, so, actually, a Shabbat, we're welcoming Shabbat at sundown. This is the tenth day of Nisan, which is the day of selection of the lamb. So this is the day that the families would select their lamb to be slain on the 14th. So this is the selection day. So it's really a special day, and we know that this particular passage was the passage that when Yeshua walked into Jerusalem, this was said about him as he was coming into Jerusalem before the Passover. So that's um, so it's a special day, and I just wanted to welcome you and just. Uh, Join me with your heart and your mind and everything about you. We'll just ask God to continue to be with us as he's with us always. Because he lives within us, he lives in our hearts, and this is he lives in our temple that we live for him. So Father God, we come tonight before you asking for your presence, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are so kind and so gentle to us, that you love us and care for us, and Lord, we ask that you would just hear our cry, our cries, Lord, we thank you that your mercies are new every morning, thank you, Lord, that you are the great I am, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and we ask that you would just meet every need, every cry of every heart, Lord, we need you. And we know that everything we need for life and godliness comes from you, the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, no shadow of turning. So we thank you, Lord, as we gather. So just as we welcome the Sabbath, we're going to have the shofar blown. So amen. 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 Shana 
Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to be a light to the nations, and who gave to us Jesus our Messiah, the light of the world. Amen. Hallelujah. So we're all going to stand and face east. So that's the back wall where the television's on, and we're going to recite together. We're going to sing the Shema in Hebrew, and then we'll recite it in English, and the words are on the front panel. Shima is over next year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Monday night, Monday night, April 22nd, wow. 2024 is the first night of Passover. Next so we plan year. to next year. Okay. Next, next year. Next year. Jerusalem. Next year. 2024. Next year in Jerusalem. <laughs> oh. Ho hopefully next year in Jerusalem though, yes. That's what you're supposed to say. Well, so we have lots of poems here. Music. Music. <laughs> yeah. um, Marilyn has beautiful music on the ringtone. Yes. And, of course, Tuesday night, we're going to be celebrating Passover here. We're what time? Five o'clock. So... <laughs> what time? Five o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not Jewish time, that's five o'clock. <laughs> so, Jerusalem time will be, will be starting, really, once everybody gets in the building. Right. right but it could right. be, like, 5.45ish. Yes. Well, hopefully, we'll okay. start... We actually have... We're, we're trying to be out of the building that night by nine-ish or so. Well, hopefully, well, maybe soon. But in terms of everything being done and the building being locked and all of that, just to give you a little little heads up. What's that? We're gonna get there at four. Yeah, we need to get there at four to help. Well, you, you, you no, actually no, at one o'clock. At one o'clock, Janet's got some volunteers coming. Okay. I mean, if you want to come. So, so that's Jay's coming, our, Sony's uh, coming. If you want to come, at one o'clock, at one o'clock, it shouldn't take us an hour, an hour and a half. Okay, I'll see. Yeah, well, and I'll I'll probably be there as well. So, anyway, and then I'll touch base with you about what time I can get you know, get situated. Hunter said, when you want to get there, he'll be there. Well, he doesn't want to wait around all day for me, so we need to coordinate. Okay, yeah. so we'll, we'll make that work. Make sure it works out. Um, also, um, just be be in prayer as we 
uh, go forward. I'm, I'm praying that some of the Jewish people that we've invited and uh, we have... I have two. I know. I want one more. Anybody know a, a Jew? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's so Would funny. You read the room? Yeah. You think, oh, I love look who's it. asking, right? Would you, <laughs> Would you look who's asking? Well, I'm excited. Yes, me too. You know what? This yeah. is an exciting time. Yes. It is. Yeah. For redemption. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't, you got to go find a Jewish person and bring them. Yeah. Right. And treat them. Right. 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 That's, That's right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. What I did, I have a mutual friend with Janet, and she was reticent about coming. So I called her and I said, Andrea, I need you there to support me. So just come to support me because I have no one to support me that night. And she went, I'm there for you. And so thank you for inviting her. And, and they're excited. They've been planning their outfits ever since. <laughs> Always planning our outfits. But you know what's so funny? She's not heard really the message that Jesus is Messiah yet. Yeah, she will. But you know what? It's like saturating. Right. And she said something to me about Jesus and Moses the other day. She said, I can't hear you. She said, is it a Jesus and Moses kind of a deal? And I went, that's kind of a... <laughs> yes, I said, yes. She, she's actually she's that's what she understands, right? She's actually been to one of our Passover. She before. came before, right. yes, but I'm praying. Yes, Last time she came, I was singing the sacrifice lamb by lamb, and she said that had I sung it one more time, she would have been weeping uncontrollably. I said, well, that would be the Holy Spirit touching me. So we pray. We want Jewish people to have the scales fall off their eyes and recognize Jesus, Yeshua, as Lord. Hey, Gloria. Hi. Welcome. It's my friend Gloria, everyone. Hi. 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 Welcome. So, do you want to sit up front? No, I'm sorry. You went too far. Gloria, you can put, Gloria, you can put a chair right over here next to the piano. Gloria, you can come sit right next to here. Bring your chair next to the piano. So, welcome, welcome, and we'll... So the other night, Carmen and I were talking, and I love this scripture. I said to her, you know, God causes the boundary lines of your life to fall in pleasant places. So I want to read that tonight out of the Amplified. Actually, I'll do the Passion Translation first. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance, my cup. He is all that I need. You support my lot. The boundary lines of the land have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. And this is what it says in the Amplified. Yahweh, you alone are my inheritance. You are my prize, my pleasure, and my portion. You hold my destiny and its timing in your hands. Your pleasant path leads me to pleasant places. I'm overwhelmed by the privileges that come with following you. Is that beautiful? And you know, there's things in every one of our lives where we don't know what's happening sometimes. And yet we know who holds us. But his promise is that it will all fall in pleasant places for us. So whatever place you're in tonight, all day I had this weight on me this morning. And you know, sometimes we let disappointment linger. I was feeling disappointed, and then I finally sat down at my piano and started pouring my heart out. When I was a young man, I first moved to the deserts before I ever became a professional graphic designer, and I knew how to do three things. I knew how to play the piano, I knew how to worship, and I knew how to pour out my heart. And David says in Psalm 62, 5 through 8, the last portion, 
pour out your heart before him. For God is a refuge for us. And then it ends with Selah. We rest in that place. So if you need to pour out your heart, I did that all afternoon. I sat there and poured my heart out. And I just, and David says, you know, when my heart's overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. Yes. In one translation, it says a rock that is too high to reach without God's help. Do some of you feel like you've got that mountain in front of you? Tonight, I love that. If he had to, he would pick us up and carry us on his back <laughs> over that rock. So tonight, pour out your heart before him. God is our refuge.
love Psalm 91. So many years, I had an old upright piano, and I have this Bible held together with duct tape. <laughs> and all the Psalms are held together with reinforced tape, because I would pour my heart out. David says, trust in the Lord at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him, for God is your refuge. And so I've done that over and over and over and over again. And I know many in this room have been in that place. We hide ourselves under his pinions. One translation says he stretches a pavilion over us. Or his wings over us. I've talked about that many times. But I imagine sometimes when I go to the high desert and see those pinion trees, I imagine God stretching that over me, where nothing can get at me. I shared this with Stephanie a few weeks ago when I went to her church service that I believe the greatest form of worship is just to trust God. Amen. And she said, oh Tom, I trust him with everything that's in me. And I know she does. Many of us in that room tonight feel that. See, I knew God was gonna do something tonight because all day his spirit's been resting on me. And he said, you know God, you're on me, something is gonna happen tonight. And it has to do with the psalm. I believe everything that we have need of is found in Psalm 91. Our rest, our warfare. So tonight, I wrote this song many, many years ago. I told this story before. I was a young man, about 21. We had started a church, and we had amazing vocalists in the church. I wasn't one of them. And. I sang with too much vibrato back then, so I threw them all off so they would never let me sing. So there was a Sunday where they were all going to be gone. And the pastor said, well, Tom, would you like to do a special? I'm going, I'm not a vocalist, you know. And so I said, well, I'm going to trust God to write something. And so it came time, and they thought I was going to get up and do a special. And I did this. I said, you know, I'm a worshiper. So that's pretty special yes, amen. that we get to worship him together yes. like this. I've said this before. I love yes. worshiping alone. I love in my car. <coughs> but I love this. The scripture says he moves in to our praise. He moves in. So as we sing this tonight, declaring his shelter over us, there's a part in the song that says, Oh God, I trust in you. I trust. In you. I had no idea that this song would set a course in my life of learning to trust him. And these words came out of my 21 year old mouth and I poured my heart out in worship. I had no idea. But the Holy Spirit that lives in us knows how to pray. The scripture says when we don't know how to pray, he knows how. Whether we're 20 and whether we're not 20. <laughs> He knows how, when we don't even have the words, the Holy Spirit, as we pour out our heart, knows.
scripture and seasons is also translated as festivals and we know that in in Jewish life you're supposed to go to Jerusalem three times a year for three particular festivals mm -hmm. and it's it's interesting that this particular day I don't think any other day in the Jewish calendar is it mentioned four separate distinct times in our in the Word of God so I'm not going to go over all of that but you can, if you want to look them up, Exodus 12, 3, which we talked about earlier, which says, Speak to the assembly of Israel and say on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb or kid for his family, one per household. That's the Passover lamb. And then in Joshua 4, 19, it says, The people came up out of the garden on the tenth day of the first month and camped at Gilgal by the eastern boundary of Jericho, or as we know, Jericho. It's probably the oldest continuous living city in the world, Jericho. And if some of you have been by there or through there or in there, it's quite a place uh, today especially. But anyway, we won't dwell there. <laughs> um, and then Ezekiel 41, 40 verse 1, in the 25th year of exile at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, this was the 14th year after the city of Jerusalem was struck, and it was on that very day that the hand of Adam and I was on me, and he took me there. That's Ezekiel having a vision, which there's more to that. And then, of course, as I spoke of earlier, um, the, the fourth, the, the tenth day is related to, and I'll get it right this time, Baruch Habab Hashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We know that that day was the 10th day of Nisan. So it, it was four days before Passover. And some of the, sometimes the calendars are hard to follow. But the other thing that I want to say is the first, in Leviticus 23, it enumerates all the festivals. And the most important and first festival to celebrate is Shabbat. So that's why we celebrate Shabbat. So, and it's something, it's a special day, it's a God that day that God gave us to, for rest, yeah. renewal, rejuvenation, and restructuring and reordering of our life. Because we know the week is full of terror and trauma <laughs> and trials and trouble and every tea you can think of. Yeah. And the Sabbath <laughs> so, is the queen. What's that? The Sabbath and the Sabbath is the queen of the week, yes. So, um, so I, I just say, um, tonight we have many things to resolve, all of us do, but he is the healer, he is the resolver, he makes everything right, and we know that 
everything we need for life and godliness comes from Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. So, our dear sister Rochelle, um, some of us don't know you. <laughs> it's okay. It is okay. They don't even know me. <laughs> they just need to know you. Yes. Okay. They're gonna find out. We're gonna find out. <laughs> I'm challenged. Roger, where's the honest? On top of you. I'm sorry, folks. It's okay. You can blow a mean trumpet. That's amazing. It's amazing yes. grace. <laughs> Can we tweak it a little? I hear the tinny feedback on my T's and my P's. And <laughs> but no, I, I, all I can do is blow. The Lord takes care of the rest. <laughs> and then I say, it didn't blow it. Thank you, God. <laughs> uh, I... It's not about me. That's why I say it doesn't matter about me. My name's Rochelle, but I'll answer to anything. And I just had the privilege of getting to share with you all. And uh, wow, what a powerful night already. Um, Thomas has just set us so well. You know, I just sit there and drink that in. And then it's like, how do I follow? Bruce, forgive me. I'm going to call your shirt a matzah shirt. <laughs> You all got to wonder why, but from the distance, especially with the, oh, the prayer shawl and like also, it looks like matzo. <laughs> if it was tan colored, you would look like you're wearing a piece of matzo. <laughs> so. I mean, fishers of men. So there there's, there's, there's fish on the... Oh, oh. oh okay. Okay. I guess I need glasses. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You, you, you see what God shows you. <clears throat> Man, I, to, to be his matzah is, you know, he's the bread of life. Yes, you can't man. get better than that. Jim now, here it comes, Jim. Say. What did you say? Well, well as, as long as the fish have scales and fins. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. He's talking kosher, if you don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, it is a very special night. <clears throat> Excuse me. Being the 10th of Nisan, it's not anything that we can just pass by and not think about. And I love when everything is coming together because in our par shop, which means the portion of scripture that we are to be reading, it is continually giving us instruction through this time, but it has especially the laws of the korbanot, the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices, the offerings of the tabernacle, the kohanim, the, the priests are specifically directed and given instruction very detailed instruction. Then we get the five major offerings that there are, the Allah, which is an ascending offering, the Mecha, the meal offering, the Shalimim, the peace offering, the Chatat, the sin offering, and the Asham, the guilt offering. There's so much in this, so much, and I'm just racing through it because I can't keep you till midnight. They told me I couldn't. <laughs> We have the detail on the ashes, and we've just been on an, an in-depth study of the red heifer that took us three weeks. We talked about what we do with those ashes, and then we have more commands for keeping. We have the consecrating ceremony for Aharon, for Aaron, to be he and his family, the, the priestly line that will continue on. And in this, we have the washing, we have the anointing with oil, we have the sacrifice being made, and all of this just builds like a crescendo on what we have been going through. Then when we look at our Haftor portion, and that's the portion that comes after the first five books, it's the, the prophetic books, we always take a portion from there, and here we have a great warning. I wish our people would think and take to heart. They were warned because they were neglecting their temple worship. They were not keeping the sacrifices. They were not keeping all that they were to do in relation to the temple. And God was warning them. He was warning them that they're lacking in sacrifices. They're lacking in worship. They're lacking because they're bringing in idolatry. It wasn't that they weren't worshiping, but they weren't worshiping the one true and living God, the God of Israel. And so judgment was coming. He was warning them. It was going to be severe. There was going to be no voice of mirth. There was going to be no gladness. The bridegroom, the bride, they weren't going to be. It was going to be silent. And when we think about that, 
our wedding ceremonies are so joyous. He was warning them the land would come to waste if they had heeded and if they had turned back what they could have prevented for themselves. And we see the similarity to where we are today because we have Israel back in the land, but sadly we have a rebellious Israel back in the land. She is not following her God yet, but I say the word yet. And there is coming, there's been warning and there's coming. But in the midst of all of that, we get a chance to stop and we get to focus. And even though we do this every year, every year, it's not to become tradition. It's not to become just ritual. It's not to become, I can do it with my eyes closed. They are to stop and they are to think. And how perfectly timed for us, because Passover is next week. We're coming for Pesach on Tuesday night. Hope you have your reservations in. I hope you're planning on being around to help and, and give Janet support. But it's all about the lamb. There's just no other way to put it. It is all about the lamb. And it starts now. It starts on the 10th of Nisan. It starts on choosing out that lamb. And it fits perfectly because I want to take us through the scriptures looking at the lamb. You see, God has put many object lessons in our scriptures. He's given us many different ways to view his Messiah, to view to view God, really. But when it comes to our Messiah, I love the fact that we look at him, we see one role of the suffering, the sacrificial, the servant. And then we see the ruling and the reigning and the royalty yes. the king. And the lamb depicts both. We will see both. We see the suffering, but we can't leave out the triumph. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure, stay with me, because we're going to travel. We're going to start in Bereshit. We're going to start in Genesis, but we're going to end up in Revelation. And I always have to say when I have new people, I have to preface it. It's not a divided book. It's not two separate books. It's not a Christian book and a Jewish book. Right. Don't get me started. It is one book. It is a continuous story. It is a his story. His story. And it goes completely so that you start in the beginning with Bereshit. You start with creation. You start with being introduced to, an, a, a, to the God of creation. Do you realize everything you're looking around and seeing, he created. And I love that scripture starts not with a question mark and not with a defense, not with an explanation, it starts with a statement, in the beginning, God. Boom. And then we go from there. And by the time we get to Revelation, in this continuation, I love to give Revelation its full title, because I think this stops short when you just call it the book of Revelation. I like the fact that it opens up and tells you it is the revelation of, and I'll say it in our Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach, is the revelation of Jesus, the Messiah. Well, guess what? We started learning about him all the way back in Bereshit. And when we look at the lamb, the first stop off that we have with the lamb is in chapter 4. We barely get out of creation. We barely get started with a family. We know that we've got a, a, an Abba and an Ima, a father and a mother. We've got two boys. The boys have grown up enough that they're adults. They're responsible. And boom. Actually, I should back up. We have the start in chapter 3, because we have that Adam and Eve were covered with skins. Mm. So we know that there had to have been something that these skins came from. But chapter 4 really introduces us to the fact that there is a sacrifice. We know in chapter 3 it is promised that the seed of the woman would come and it would be the Messiah. But chapter 4, when we look at the lamb in chapter 4, I'm talking about Aval, Abel's lamb. And when you look at this one, Aval gives a sacrifice to God, and God is pleased with it. His brother Cain, Cain gives a sacrifice to God, and he's not pleased with it. There's a stark difference between these two. 
Cain Ka'an, he had brought what he had, the best of what he had. He was a farmer, he had brought what he had worked on, what he had done with his hands. He was proud. And God said, that's not what I'm looking for. And I love that. Because I would never feel like I had something good enough <laughs> to bring. But God said, it's not about you. It's not about you bringing your best. <clears throat> it's a picture that I want you to see because I've given my best. Mm. And this is what you're drawing a picture of. Mm -hmm. So a ball sacrifice involved blood because he brought a sacrificed animal. He brought a lamb. And this is how God, we know, was already instructing that Kion didn't do it accidentally. He did it out of a rebellious heart. He was, I'm good enough. And how many people today tell God that still? Well, I haven't done this. I haven't done that. And on the contrary, I have done this. And I have done that. And God says, that's not what it's all about. It's about that lamb. And we go from chapter 4 in Bereshit to chapter 22. And we have another example here in chapter 22. And if you're not familiar, this is Abraham and Yitzhak, Abraham and Isaac. And this is when God has told Abraham to take his only son, the one that the promise is to come through for that coming Messiah. And he's to sacrifice his son. Now this is strange. Abraham can't comprehend it, but he's developed a walk with the Lord where he knows enough to say, okay, I will be obedient to you. And he knew in his heart that if God allowed him to sacrifice his son, God would raise his son from the dead because he knew that promise was coming through that son. And he knew that he and his son would return to those who were staying back as they went forward. In this time, as Abraham went up, you can imagine the heaviness of his heart, the confusion in his mind. His son asks a question, we've got everything but the lamb. Where's the lamb, Abba? Where's the lamb? And those famous words that Abraham said, that God will provide himself a lamb. And I love that in our Hebrew, it can go two ways, and I think that's on purpose, because I think they're both right. That God will provide. He'll provide himself a lamb. And God will provide himself a lamb. Mm -hmm. We're not even out of bare sheet yet. What a picture we're getting. What we're beginning to see. And we're realizing as we see that lamb set aside on the tenth, we're going to be thinking about that lamb for the next four days. We go into Shemot, into Exodus. We're going to do this one in detail in just a few days. So just let me say in short, chapter 12, we have the Passover lamb. We have the lamb for Pesach. We have strict instructions of what we're to do with that lamb. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, come next week. <laughs> I have to hurry just a little bit because I'm not going to do 66 books, don't worry. <laughs> I have to keep us moving. And we come into Viagra, we come into Leviticus, and Leviticus tells us very specifically we need a sin offering. We need the chatat. We need the sin offering. And Leviticus tells us that God has put blood on the altar for the remission of sins. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I'll leave us with a question. Hmm, when did God put blood on the altar? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are we looking to something? Is it foreshadowed? Is it being pictured? And what a picture is developing, because I'll take us rapidly into the prophets, I'll take us to Yeshua, Isaiah. And we have to stop off at chapter 53. Mm -hmm. Our rabbis don't like to. Do you know what they do? Because in the Hof Torah, we don't read in order. They'll read up through the end of 52. They leave out the last, the very last. And the next time they pick up the, the scroll of Yeshua, Isaiah, they start reading in 54. But because it wasn't just a week apart, our people never even realize that they haven't read it. And if you ask them, why don't we read it, they'll tell you it is too controversial. Mm -hmm. And they'll tell you they don't know who that is. They try to say Israel, but I'll challenge you, go home and read that chapter and try to put a nation 
into that chapter and you will see it never fits. The nation of Israel, my heart, I love, <laughs> but it does not fit that chapter. What a picture, the suffering, the servant, as I had said earlier, the, the sacrificial. We have this one who is so disfigured, who is suffering. He comes from humble origins. He's despised. He's rejected. He suffers physical wounds. He's treated like he's a leper. His friends have departed from him. And he takes on himself infirmities. He takes on himself diseases. He takes on himself transgressions and iniquities. Wow. I mean, this is deserving of the greatest punishment. The punishment, the wages of sin is death. And he takes it on himself. The climax of this servant's vicarious suffering. How could we see it any better than to see a little innocent lamb being led to the slaughter? What a picture. Again, Israel, I love you, but you don't fit there. <laughs> we continue on. I'm going to carry us into the Brit Hadashah, into the New Covenant, and we have Yochanan, John. I love, there's so much in his book. First chapter, we don't even get past it, verse 29. And it says, Behold. You know, anytime you read Behold in Scripture, what God's saying? Wake up. <laughs> Wake up. Look. Hello. Don't miss this. <laughs> now, every word of God is important, but when we get a Behold, we need to Behold it. And Yohanan is in the midst of baptizing those who are following him. They know that, the, that they need to repent from sin. It's all they know. And they're trying to do what they believe is right. But Yohanan has a depth of understanding. He knows that he is the forerunner. And he knows who he is the forerunner for. He is, even says later that he declines so that the other can rise. He has no problem with that. And he points to this one. And he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think back to all those sins we just mentioned from Yeshia, Isaiah 53. And who did he say that about? Did he see a little lamb? Did he see something coming that was bad? No. He's talking and pointing to a man, a very humble man, origins of question, very quiet, and yet he's got such an authority about him such a dignity about him and he is going to go about doing so much taking on for so many healing the sick giving sight to the blind the ears that are open to hear those that are raised from the dead i still question how did they not recognize even the one who came to yeshua by night said it's the works you're doing you have to come from god how else could you do those works? But the majority didn't hear Yochanan's words. And why did Yochanan use that example? Do you think that God ordained that through the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, <coughs> that he had the insight to Avraham's sacrifice to Yeshaya, Isaiah 53, to see and to say this, Behold, the Lamb of God, who's taking away the sin of the world. In our complete Jewish Bible, even Leviticus, it says, Behold, God's Lamb that is taking away the sin of the world. Puts it into action. We go past Yochanan, we come into Acts. We get to Acts chapter 8. Eight's new beginnings, I love it. We have Philip. Philip's a good Jewish boy. If you don't know him, study him in Acts. He gets an opportunity, and I love what he does with it. He's, it, he, is, he meets an Ethiopian eunuch. This is one who is from Ethiopia that had come up with a business of the queen that was at hand. He's on his way back down, and in his chariot or whatever he's riding in, he's got a scroll open, and he's reading it, and he can't figure it out. He's really puzzled. I think he must have whispered up a little prayer that said, God, help. I don't understand. But all of a sudden, Philip, who has been sent, told where to go, told to catch up with this, hears this one reading and starts to talk with him. And 
basically I'll read it for us in just a little bit, but I'm going to hold you there. I'll tell you who explains Yeshaya, Isaiah 53, but I'll come back to that. I'll visit that in a moment. Diving on down, we come to Kepha, Peter. All the way at the end, though, not in the act, not in the Gospels where we have what he did, but I'm taking you to First Key, First Peter, chapter one and verses 18 to 21. Again, I'm going to read those in a few moments. Also, I'm just highlighting so you get a whole picture. We're going to come back and look at a couple of the details. In that, in those verses alone, he talks about the death and the resurrection of the Lamb. Now, our eunuch is wondering who is being talked about. Our people have been doing sacrifices every year. They have Pesach every year. They've got the lamb tied to the door. But are they comprehending? Are they catching the picture? I have to take you into Revelation. I love it. Because it's revealing Yeshua HaMashiach, as I already said, that in Revelation chapter 5, we have the lamb. We have the lamb that's in relation to the throne. I'll tell you exactly how in a few moments that he's taking the scroll. And that scroll is very important also. This lamb has a great action that's happening in chapters 21 and 22, the very end of our complete scriptures, has the lamb. Has the lamb on the throne, shows the bride, the wife of the lamb, talks about the apostles of the lamb, talks about names being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The Lamb has a book and a throne that belongs to the Lamb. All of that in the last two chapters. I think the Lamb is significant. I think we need to back up and look at that Lamb. So let me take you once again all the way back to Bereshit, Genesis chapter 4, and let me tell you there was the necessity of the Lamb. They had to bring a sacrifice. They had to bring the right sacrifice to be acceptable. Kion did not, and it was not accepted. Aval did, and his was accepted. In Bereshit chapter 22, we see the provision of the lamb. God provided the lamb. It's necessary, and God provided. That encourages us. God's always providing. When we come to Shemot, Exodus chapter 12, we have the slaying of the lamb. This is not a lamb that is that continues to live. This is a lamb that dies. Leviticus, by Akra, gives us the character of that lamb. It's not any lamb that will do. It had to be a pure lamb, a spotless lamb. It had to be, in essence, sinless. It had to show perfection. We see that in chapter 4, chapter 9, chapter 14, chapter 23. Viacric is much of that. When we come to Isaiah, Yeshaya 53, and we look at the lamb there, I think very much we get the personality of the lamb. We get a little idea of what he's like. A man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. He had every right to lash out. And yet he doesn't even open his mouth. He goes quietly, like the lamb, to the slaughter. Yochanan John gave us the identity of the lamb. He pointed him out. This is the lamb of God. And he pointed to him. He made it specific. I've got two words trying to come out at the same time there. <laughs> Let me give it to you in Greek because we have scriptures written in Greek from Yochanan. There are two words for lamb. And in Yochanan 1, the word that is used is amnos in our English, and it's a type of an innocent with a sacrificial connotation. So when Yochanan called him out as a lamb, he was pointing out this is an innocent one. But this is one who is going to be a sacrifice. There's a little different word. They're still similar, but there's a little different word, and I'll tell you when it comes out in a moment. I love the fact, when the lamb first came into this world, and of course I'm not speaking of a little lamb now, but I'm speaking of the lamb of God. When he came into this world, who got told first? Bingo. The shepherds. He's a lamb. Who is going to be interested in the lamb? The shepherds. The shepherds with their sheep 
are introduced to the fact that the Lamb of God has come. Wow. It is a wow, isn't it? It is a wow. <laughs> and I got to tell my little niece, two and a half years old at the time, her her email wanted to make sure she was understanding it was Christmas time. They were leaving an area where a church had one of the creches on the roof. And it was a very simple one on the church roof. It just had Mary and Joseph and, and the baby in the manger. And that was it. So my sister in love looked up and pointed to it and said, Becca, who's that? And she popped right up and she says, That's Mary. And her little lamb. <laughs> and we chuckled and we laughed and we think how sweet. But then I thought a second thought. Yes. Out of the mouth of babes. Yes. How right yes. she was. Mary and her little lamb. When we come into Acts chapter 8, we have Yeshua as the lamb. Made very clear. Let me read you those verses now. This is Philip meeting with that Ethiopian eunuch. Verses 30 to 35 in Acts chapter 8, as Philip ran up, he heard the Ethiopian reading from Yeshiahu, from the prophet Isaiah. Do you understand what you're reading? How can I, says the Ethiopian eunuch, unless someone explains it to me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Perfect. Come. Explain it to me. And oh, how my heart cries for our Jewish people around us to say, would you come explain this to me? What is this? What's the lamb all about? Why is it so important? And notice how prepared Philip was. Of course, it's the Holy Spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh that was on him. It says the portion of the Tanakh, what we use for the word for what we call the original scriptures, the portion he was reading said this, he was like a sheep led to the slaughter. Like a lamb silent before the shearer, he does not open his mouth. He was humiliated. He was denied justice. Who will tell about his descendants since his life has been taken from the earth? We have a time of oppression described here. We have a calamity on hand. We have one that was so destitute that when his life was taken, this one was concerned. Who's going to tell? Who's going to carry the story on? Who's going to tell about it? This one was delivered up to death, a cruel and unusual, a death he didn't deserve. He was condemned by a wicked generation of an enormous crime, and they thought it was worthy of putting him to death. Who's going to vindicate him? Who is going to declare who he really was? Because he was cut off from the land of the living. And the eunuch is trying to understand. The eunuch says to Philip, here's my question for you. Is the prophet talking about himself? Is Isaiah describing himself? Or is he talking about someone else? Well, see, he caught it half right. He caught this is somebody. This isn't a nation. This is a person. But who is it? And what does Philip do? He opens his mouth and he starts to speak beginning with that very passage. And he went on to tell him the good news of the Messiah. Took him right where he was and just started expounding. And as he expounded, I have to ask. And one day I'll ask Philip, did you take him to Genesis 4? Did you stop off at 22? Did you bring in Viagra? Oh, and don't miss the Pesach, the lamb in Shemot 12. I wonder if he didn't take him through the scriptures we're looking at tonight because they relate to the Lamb. Whatever he did, the Ethiopian caught it, hook, line, and sinker, <laughs> because as soon as he saw water, he was so in, he wanted to be in over his head. And he asked, what's stopping me from being baptized? Now, he came to believe. Romans 6, 9 says, we know that the Messiah has been raised from the dead, never to die again. Death has no authority over him. And the eunuch realized this is the living Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Remember I took you to Kepha, and in Kepha we see that resurrection of the Lamb. We see it spelled out very clearly as I read to you now those verses, first chapter 18 to 21. 
knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold. And I'll put in there and not like what Kion brought from the land, his best to offer. Whatever, not from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but you have been redeemed with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished, spotless. And then he spells it out. He does not leave it for question. He says, the blood of Messiah. In your version, it will say Christ. That's what Christ means is Messiah, anointed one. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead, who gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. Mm -hmm. Kipa said it all. And did you catch that? When was this planned? We see it from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. But you know what? It was planned before then. Mm -hmm. It was planned before the foundations of the world. Remember our Creator? And we're looking around on Shabbat especially and we're remembering. And God says, before I even did that for you, I planned the Lamb. What a picture. <coughs> and through that, the story does not stop with that death. And I say, hallelujah. Those of you who have been with me, you know where I'm headed. Third day. <laughs> <laughs> Do not miss it. We're seeing it again and again and again. And we have to tell the whole story. Resurrection comes. Resurrection day. The most important day. And that lamb that did sacrificially give his life. As Yeshua described. As the other prophet said. As the scriptures foretold. We take him now to Revelation again. Taken to Revelation chapter 5, and here we're going to see he is enthroned on the, I said it the wrong way, he's on the throne. <laughs> he's enthroned. <laughs> he's enthroned. The lamb, that sacrificial little lamb that we see, it's a symbol of, uh, well, the lamb itself. You don't look at the lamb like you look at the lion. You look at the lamb as gentle. You look at the lamb as innocent. You look at the lamb as purity, sweet, meek, forgiveness. But Revelation 5 gives us a little different. We see the lamb slain, but we also see the lion. And here you have the lion and the lamb together. And I love to say it. The lamb is not in the lion's stomach. <laughs> we have a picture of perfect peace. We have a picture of paradise. We have a picture of the millennial reign that is coming and of the future of eternity. We have the lamb as if he was slain. And we have the lion of the tribe of Judah, the roaring lion, the king of the jungle. Verse 5, though, before we get to that point, tells us, one of the elders said to Yochanan, John, John's crying. I should tell you that. John is so upset, Yochanan. He's been, he's heard the question. There's a scroll in the hand of Elohim. This scroll is so critical and so important, and it needs to be opened. But the only one who can open it is the one who owns it. And so they put out the voice throughout the heavens, above the heavens, beneath the heavens, on earth, throughout the heavens. Who is worthy? Who can open the scroll? And you know what? sees no one can. And it breaks his heart and he's crying because there's just no one to open the scroll. Mm -hmm. And that's when this elder said, stop. Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that's from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has overcome. He's paid the price. He's bought back. He has the right to open that scroll. Do you know what the scroll is? It's the title deed to the earth. We are on this earth. He bought it back for us. He redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb. 
That's our ticket into that heaven, is through that scroll being owned by the one who burst through the curtain of heaven, pinned it back with nails, and put his blood on the altar in heaven. That same one that Viagra Leviticus described to us when God said, I have put the blood on the altar for the forgiveness of sin. That's what he was talking about. That's what we're seeing. Verses 6 and 7 of Revelation 5. Then I, Yochanan, standing there with the throne and the four living beings and the circle of the elders, a lamb appeared as if he'd been slaughtered. We, he could see the markings. Do you realize through all of eternity we will see the markings? We will be reminded of the great cost of the sacrificial lamb. He came, he took the scroll out of the right hand of the one sitting on the throne, and when he took the scroll, the four living beings, the 24 elders, fell down in front of the lamb. And we know they fell down in worship. And this is when our Greek uses the different word for lamb. This time it uses the word arnion, A-R-N-I-O-N, -N, kind of from our Greek to our English, and this is referring to a little lamb. It's the idea of a person who's pure. It's a picture of innocence, even virgin-like emotions. That's all in the word lamb being used here in this one. And I think, wow, what a sacrifice. What amazing. What picture could depict this better than to show all of the steps? We have the suffering servant, sacrificial servant, and now we're going to see that royal reigning ruler. Verses 9 and 10, they sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals. Why was he worthy? They tell us, because you were slaughtered. At the cost of your blood, you ransomed for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And I'll ask you, are you a people? Are you a tribe? Are you from a nation? If you're in any of that description, and if you're not, I don't know what you are, <laughs> then he's talking about you. You made them into a kingdom for God to rule. Kohanim, to serve him, you get to be part of his priestly servants. And they will rule over the earth, and we will see the fulfillment of what God promised to Israel he will do with the nation of Israel, because she no longer will be that rebellious Israel. She will be, as Bruce brought us earlier, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Israel is going to look up and see her God. And how is she going to see him? Pierced. Zechariah, Zechariah 12, 10 tells us that God will pour out the spirit of grace and supplication on the people. And they will see him, God, whom that was pierced. And they'll know, they'll mourn that we missed it. That's, that, as if it's their most precious son. Have you heard Bruce and Janet talk about Eli? Yeah. <laughs> Is he their precious son? Yeah. Their only son? <laughs> Do we get an inkling? God gave his all. And he gave them in the picture of this lamb. We see the work. We see the, the cutting off, the violent death. We see the suffering. We see the blood spilled. But hallelujah, we see him at the throne, yeah. sitting on the throne. Yeah. And throned around him are all those falling down in worship. Yeah. And I can't wait, Thomas, to join yeah. <laughs> in worship. And there they are. Yochanan looked and he heard the sound of a vast number of angels, thousands of thousands and millions of millions. Wrap your mind around to that. I saw a sea of people on the news again the other day. It wasn't millions and millions and thousands and thousands. And I thought, wow, you know, it's like a speck of, of sand on the, the, the ocean floor. And yet all of 
these and what are they doing? Can you hear it? They were all around the throne, the living beings, the elders, and they shouted out, worthy is the slaughtered lamb. Do you notice what they bring out? They're not saying worthy is the king. That's true too. But they're bringing out, this is the one. The one who didn't deserve it. The one who willingly gave his all. And they say that he's worthy, he's the, the, the slaughtered lamb, he's worthy to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, praise. And the only thing I can add to that is hallelujah. <laughs> praise to our God. Verse 13, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, under the earth and on the sea. Yes, everything in them. I can't wait. Can you imagine? Heavens shouting and declaring and worshiping. Earth shouting and declaring yes. and worshiping. I think the little fishies are jumping up out of the <laughs> sea, worshiping and praising and declaring all because it, the scriptures tell us all creation is groaning and is moaning for that release to be free. And they are saying to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb, they're saying it to Elohim, they are saying it to Mashiach, to the Lamb. Praise honor, glory, power. How long, Janet? Forever. Her favorite word. <laughs> Forever and ever and ever. And then the only Christian that we can put on this is we put the crown on the Lamb. Yeah. Revelation 21 and 22, we see the kingship of the Lamb. 22 verses 1 and 3, he showed me the river of the water of life. And we know the water of life, the, the, the Ruch HaKodesh, we know that, that out of uh, Yeshua, he said that out of the, the belly would flow the rivers of living water. We've talked about this. They're flowing from the throne, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Notice it's the Lamb. We're putting a crown on the Lamb, and I love it. There will no longer be any curse. Hallelujah. <laughs> the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His bond servants. that's us. That's those of us who come to believe in Him. We will serve Him. Hallelujah. This is what we get to do. And this is the crescendo of our Word of God. He starts with giving that first sacrificed lamb and he ends with a crown on the lamb on the throne receiving all praise and glory and honor and everything that he is worthy of wow all of that in a little lamb tied to a doorpost being watched developing a relationship it was costly this lamb had to go through the agony of his father turning away when he took on and became the sin offering for mankind. That was his agony of Gethsemane. The agony of a holy, pure, perfect, sinless, taking on sin. The sin offering. What amazing grace. What amazing love. If you're here tonight and you don't feel loved, there's no greater love than a man lays down his life for another. If you're here feel, feeling like the world's too much, this problem is too big, ah, the God who created it all, who can put all of this in order and make it happen at the specific time foretold. I can't tell you the future for 10 minutes from now and hit it on the nail. But God nailed it, and I used that expression purposely. We know that those who are redeemed, they are redeemed from the precious blood of Messiah, the Lamb without blemish or defect. Keep us at that again, 1 Peter 1, 19. And he tells us it was a costly, bloody, sacrificial death of the Messiah, the Lamb without defect or spot. You know what Luke 15 tells us? There were 100 sheep, 99 of them, were sick in the fold, but there was one little lost lamb. And that shepherd didn't say, eh, I've got 99, that's good enough. 
he made sure they were okay, and then he went looking for the one little lost lamb. Are you the one little lost lamb? Mm -hmm. He's calling you. He's telling you the way. The same way he saw to it that the eunuch had Philip come right by his side and explain. He's here tonight to tell you, you are loved so much that he died for you. And he didn't stay dead. That would have paid the punishment, but that would have been it. He rose in that resurrected, abundant and powerful life that he might give us that abundant life. That one day we do get taken from this earth through the, the heavens into that throne room. Do you realize you're going to get to see him sitting crowned and you're going to get to join it's not quiet in heaven. It's noisy. A million, million, all declaring the praise of the Lamb. In closing, I want to give you a Yeshua's words. Isaiah 40, verse 11. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. And he carries him close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. He's wrapping his arms around you and left right now. There's nothing short of what he's done. There's nothing more he can do. He's done it all. And he wants to bring you in, the little lost lamb. And when I'm tired, when I'm discouraged, or when I'm hurting, or when this world seems a little too rough, I say, Abba, can I crawl up in your lap? Can I put my head on your heart and hear your heartbeat? And he says, yes, little lamb, you can. Double play, that's what Rochelle means, little lamb. <laughs> what a God, what love. The Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Mm -hmm. As you go into this next week, mm -hmm. let the Lamb go with you. Mm -hmm. And just keep mm -hmm. the focus on the Lamb. Mm -hmm. Yes, there will be tears shed. Mm -hmm. There will be some hard moments in that. But, oh, that sweet victory. Mm -hmm. To see Him crowned and worthy of glory and praise and honor forever and ever. I give you the Lamb of God. Shabbat Shalom. I, I have the pleasure of having one of my longest term friends with, with us tonight. I, I met my friend Rich Price. He actually grew up in the desert, but uh, we met in Jerusalem in 1975. Um, so it's a pleasure. We, we've been friends and we talk often and uh, he's just been a great source of encouragement. We talk about really just a number of things and it's just been great he's just been a great friend and i'm i'm blessed to have him as a friend uh, you know um, so he's known me longer than anybody in the room <laughs> including my wife <laughs> so and i knew rich before he was married too so we were we were kids but we were in jerusalem <laughs> the first time so, what's that all the stories i know always a story well there's always a story yeah. There's, there was a person that I met this week, and I invited them to the Seder, and they said, oh, I'm going to Vegas that day. <laughs> and of course, it was an Israeli, Sephardic Israeli, of course. <laughs> anyway, but um, normally we say the, the benediction, and Janet's going to lead us in that, and we're going to have fellowship and we're going to 
break bread together and have the blowricus for the fruit of the vine and the bread from the earth. It's so wonderful to have you here, Rich. <laughs> Thank you. And everybody that has come this evening, so many new people. Yeah. It's fabulous. I love it. And all the people who have been here are my favorite. <laughs> Viva Rachacharanai, Vaishmarecha, Yair Adonai Panavalecha, Vichunecha, Yisaranai Panavalecha, So we're going to take just a little break, but we're going to have uh, a, the blessing, and the blessings are on the back of your. Um, so the, back, the blessing for the wine. It's not wine. It's actually a grape juice, but wine and the bread. Stay the night here, right? Thanks for the signal. All right, we'll give you two.